Come on, everyone, let's give Jesus some praise. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you just begin to tell Him, come on, let's worship Him today. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. God, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for Resurrection Sunday. We thank you, God, that you love the world so much that you gave your only son. And it doesn't matter how we came today. You said whoever believes that message will not perish but have eternal life. God, we thank you that Jesus was never sent into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world would be saved by Him. Lord, we thank you for everything that you did on the cross. We thank you that the work has been done. We thank you, God, that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we can do to make it our own apart from confess that you are worthy, that you did it all and you won it all. And on Resurrection Sunday, we remember that. The Word says that God is enthroned on the praises of His people. Father, we enthrone you today. We declare you to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we worship, we worship you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, Amen. Let's give God a hand of praise one more time. Come on. Amen. Amen. You guys could grab a seat. It is so great to have you here at church. Again, a big welcome to everybody who's joining us online. We're so glad that we get to do church twice this week. And I hope that you guys have had a great weekend so far. It's been amazing weather, which I'm very excited about. But I think that today, no matter the weather, uh, I think today is the greatest weekend that we have on the calendar. In fact, I would say that it even edges out Christmas just a little bit. Because how many of us know that it, at Christmas we understand that God became flesh and dwelt amongst us, that Jesus came, right? And that was good. But it's on this weekend that we celebrate what that meant. On this weekend, we celebrate that He gave His life, that He laid down His life, He was buried and He was resurrected. And that's the thing that we celebrate. So I think that this is the greatest weekend we have. And I'm so glad you can be here to celebrate it with us. Uh, I hope that you were able to get some chocolate this morning. I don't know if you did. I hope, I hope you did. And I'm going to pray. I feel like Easter is just a, a, a week where we celebrate miracles, right? I mean, it's a miracle, everything that, that Jesus did. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a little prayer for you. Uh, 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 there, there would be a miracle this weekend and that you will emerge out of this weekend lighter than you went into it. Yeah, yeah, because between the buns and the eggs, oh man, you, you, you know, that's going to have to be a miracle, right? But we, hey, we know that for some people, that's all they think that Easter is. It's just, it's either a long weekend to go camping with my family. It means eggs. It means buns. It means a whole bunch of things. But I think everything that you believe about Easter has everything to do with how we see the person of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, yeah. It's all about how we see him. It's who we think that he is. And you know, for us as, as Christian people, and if you're, if you're watching today or if you're part of church today and you wouldn't even consider yourself a Christian, that's fine. But for Christian people, we take our cue from what the Scriptures teach about Him. And so we would know in Philippians that it would say a few things about Jesus that we might want to mention at this point so we understand who we're talking about today. You know, the Scriptures would say that Jesus, when He was on earth, that He was the essence of God. That means that He was the same substance of God. The Scripture, as it is written, it says He was in the form of God, but we understand that the word form means essence. So what does it mean except that He was God? And so we understand that He is God, but at the same time, it said that He presented Himself in a different way. He came in the form of a servant. What do we take that to mean except that He just looked like a human? So what do we have? We have, we have someone that is in the, the very essence of God that it presents Himself in the form of a human. And if you know the story, if you understand anything about it, we know that He was born of the Virgin Mary. 
An angel told Mary that she would be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and one day she would be a virgin and the next day she would be with child. And I know it's hard to understand. That's why the angel said overshadowed because he couldn't explain it to Mary either. He said, look, you just be overshadowed. Just understand that, you know. And, and so she was overshadowed. And then what happened? She gave birth to Jesus. And so we understand that Jesus had an earthly mother, divine father, but that didn't make him 50-50. He wasn't half God, half man. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. He was the impossible. He was 200%. He was the blending of divinity and humanity, all wrapped in one person that we declare to be Jesus. And, and, you know, as Christian people, we have words that we would say to explain who He is. We would say of Jesus that He is the King of all kings. He is the Lord of lords. What do we mean by that except that that is a title fit for God Himself? What are we saying? That Jesus is the King of all kings. That Jesus is God. And that's our declaration. That's what we say. That's what we believe about Him. But how many of you would understand that you need spiritual eyes to see spiritual truth. Do you get that? You spiritually, your eyes can be shut. Spiritually, your eyes can be open. But if your eyes are open, you can see what we say. That's why, that's why some of you believe things and you've explained it to your friends and you've told them about who Jesus is, but they don't get it. They don't understand. They say he was a really nice guy. Maybe they have thoughts about him, but they don't understand it like you see it. You know, even in Jesus' day, we understand that this is true. Like, if you had have said to people in Jesus' day, hey, do you know that guy called Jesus? What would they say? they say, yeah, we know him. Jesus is uh, he's, he's a Jewish guy, right? He's Jewish. He's, uh, he's a nice guy. Uh, really, really nice guy. Uh, single parent household, oldest of all of his siblings, great carpenter, good at making stuff, right? They would say all things about him, but you and I know, now understanding the story that that is a very one-dimensional view of Jesus. We understand and we know that when we talk about Jesus in that way, all we're seeing is His humanity. What we need to understand is that His humanity completely wrapped up His divinity. And He was there all at the same time. And then Jesus began His ministry. So Jesus lived to about 30 and then for three years He did, he did ministry. And when he did, he began to say very specific things. One of the things that Jesus said when he began his ministry was repent. Now the word repent, it really means to reconsider. It means to think again. It means that you may have had thoughts or ideas about who Jesus is, but you have the opportunity every single day to reconsider and to align what you think with maybe what the Scriptures say about Him. You can think again, reconsider again. And one of the things that, come on, you and I both know that we live out of the truth we believe, right? So you would live in alignment with what you think is true, right? Nobody, nobody does that. Okay, oh my gosh, right. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we live in alignment with what we declare to be true. So if you start to think that Jesus was more than just human, that He was in fact divine, then naturally you begin to change your life. And that's what the word repent really means. It means we reconsider what we previously held as true and now we orientate first our minds and our lives begin to follow because suddenly we just live in alignment with the truth that we believe. So what did Jesus say? He said, repent, reconsider. It doesn't matter how you came into church today. It doesn't matter what you believed walking in. By the time you leave, you can think something completely different. He said, reconsider, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What does that mean? Except that it was close. What does that mean? Except that it was within reaching distance. Begin to reconsider who he is. And you know, they did. People started to reconsider. They started to think about who he was. Maybe he's more than just the servant we see. Maybe he's the king and not just the servant. Maybe he's divine and not just the man that we see. And one of the things that happened is Jesus was uh, teaching and speaking in Jerusalem and he, he gathered quite the following. 
and people decided that they were going to follow him out of Jerusalem. And he just kept leading them further and further until they got to a place that was so far. And everyone was hungry and everyone was tired. And the disciples said, oh my gosh, we kind of feel responsible for these people. What are we going to feed them? We've got nothing to feed them. So what they did is they nicked some little boy's lunch. They, st- they took a little boy's lunch. There he was walking around somehow Somehow, everyone's hungry. Some kid, meanwhile, has got five loaves, two fishes. I don't know where he got it, but that's a kid that's prepared. So he, he comes, he's got five loaves, two fishes. They take that, and what do they do? They put it in the hands of Jesus. He prays over it. He blesses it. Then they begin to distribute it. The amazing part that happened is they distributed it to 5,000 men plus women and children, right? And so now everybody's got enough to eat. I mean, this is a full-blown miracle. This is amazing. And so here they are uh, eating their food, and they started to think about who this person is. They repented in the sense that they reconsidered who he was. They said, hey, this guy is so amazing, and what he did was incredible. Maybe what we should do is grab him, and their plan was to take him by force and to make him king. And you know what it says about Jesus is that he actually withdrew to another place because he didn't need them to make him king. They changed their minds about who he was. But can I tell you today that Jesus already knew who he was? How many of you would understand that he didn't need the people to tell him that he was a king? That he didn't put his identity into the mouths of a crowd of people who one minute could say one thing and the next minute change what they believed? He didn't do that. He was already a king when they tried to make him one. Not only that, but he was a king with a kingdom that they just couldn't see. But it was close. It was close. He didn't need people to give him a kingdom. A lot of what Jesus did was about trying to get his kingdom to his people. Amen? So when we think about what Jesus did, we just see it from one side. Oh, absolutely. It means that we have forgiveness of sins and we get to live uh, an eternal life with Jesus. That's one thing that he did. He helps us to get from here to there. But how many of you would understand that he helped to get the kingdom from there to here? He had a kingdom. It was veiled. They, They simply couldn't see it. And so what did Jesus say? He said, my kingdom, it's not of this world. He said that to Pilate while he was being Uh, prepared to be crucified. And he says, are you the king of the Jews? He says, no, my kingdom is not of this world. So it's not physically here in a way that you can see, but he's been preaching for years that it's very close. It's close. It's nearly here. It's at hand. It's within reaching distance. But my kingdom is still, you know, it's not of this world. People began to shift and change their minds about who he was while he was here. They tried to figure out, is he the king as divine or is he the man as the servant? Who is he? Which one is he? Those that were close to him, they said, ah, we know who he is. Why? Because God opened their eyes. So spiritually, they could see what they could never see before. Those, they spent time with him. I mean, Jesus had disciples and they, they spent time with him. And over time, they saw what God wanted them to see. And so, you know, here are his disciples. And what did they say? They said, he's the king of kings. They say he's the Lord of Lords. They would say that he is the Messiah. He is the Christ, the one that we've been waiting for. He is the Holy One of Israel. And that was all of their confession. They changed their minds about how they see him. What does that mean? They repented. They shifted direction in alignment with what they perceived to be true about him. And here's what I find really amazing. The same crowd at Jerusalem who followed him out, And at some point in Jesus' ministry and journey, they said, we need to grab him and force him and make him to be king. We're the same crowd who stood at his trial and said, crucify him. They were all from Jerusalem. That's why Jesus never entrusted his identity to the mouths of the crowd. I guess they just changed their minds again, right? Oh, we think he should be king. Now we think we should kill him. Oh, he's divine. Maybe he's just a servant. People had trouble. 
trying to figure out who he was. And I get it. I understand it because he was the impossible. That God would become flesh and dwell amongst us is a hard concept for some people to understand. And then something happened that just changed everything. Jesus died. And that changed everything. It changed everything for the disciples specifically. Because Jesus dying, the Messiah dying, doesn't fit the narrative of a divine king. If he was the Messiah, was he not to restore the kingdom to Israel? And so they said, how can he do that if he's dead? Death is the end of every hope, right? Because it doesn't matter what plans you have. When you die, it's all over. They believed he'd restore the kingdom. Now they're looking at the Messiah that's dead and they're trying to figure out how does this make sense? Have you ever been watching a movie that you've already seen with someone who hasn't seen it? And as you're watching the movie, you already know what happens. And you're sitting there and it's your favorite movie. You love it, but you can see them and the story is taking all the twists and the turns and things are happening and you watch them and they're like, oh, and they're like, you know, panicking and they're like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And here you are just chilled, right? Why? Because you know what happens in the end. You know the end of the story. So you don't, you're not taking the roller coaster ride of, hey, what's going to happen and how will this end? You already know how it ends. There's a scenario worse than that. You hear the score of a footy game you wanted to watch. <laughs> Have you ever had this happen? Or some NBA or something, and you, you saw it, and you saw the score, and so you're watching it with people that don't know the end, and it doesn't matter who looks like they're winning. At any point, you know the end. So you're not panicking. It's kind of a little bit more boring for you because you're like, I already know what happens, right? And you, you've just ruined it for yourself, right? Jesus already understood the end at the beginning. He knew what had to happen in order to actually restore the kingdom to Israel. He knew what he was trying to accomplish. And he knew that the disciples, they didn't know exactly everything that he was going to do. So when he died, it was part of the plan. But when that happened, what are they doing? They're panicking as the story takes the twists and the turns. Come on, could you spare a thought for the disciples who were kept in the dark? who actually had no idea. I mean, it wasn't like Jesus didn't tell them at different points, but come on, like they, they, they didn't understand exactly what was going to happen. Here's the truth. Sometimes God moves in our lives and sometimes he doesn't, but often we find ourselves kept in the dark. What's he doing? How's he going to respond? The dark is not the same as doubt. There are many God fearing, Bible-believing Christians that have moments where they're in the dark. What does that mean? It means you just don't know what's going to happen. And it's not like you don't trust Him. You trust Him completely. But you know that He doesn't always do everything that you want to. To a certain extent, you're in the dark. Come on, come on. This is real life, everybody. I mean, there are moments that we pray. Surely this has happened to you. You've prayed and you've waited. And sometimes... You wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then you start to wonder, maybe he's not going to do everything that he said he was going to do. I thought I heard, maybe I got it wrong, and we wait, and we wonder, and while we wait, sometimes we do a little bit too much wondering. Sometimes our expectation of God is crushed by the reality of our circumstances and we're trying to figure out how is God going to fix my situation that I'm in? How is He going to change this? I don't know what He's going to do. I often say that you are only one experience away from having your faith challenged. It doesn't mean that you're walking away from your faith. It doesn't even mean that you doubt God. It means you go through a challenge while you're waiting and you're waiting for answers. And sometimes people, you know, I, I know this happens to people. If you wait long enough, they begin to see the king as just a servant. 
Maybe he's not everything I was told he was. Maybe he doesn't have the power to fix my situation. People that wait begin to wonder, maybe, maybe he's not who they say he is. Spare a thought for the disciples who on Saturday waited. On Friday, they saw him crucified. On Thursday, they confessed him as the Christ. But by the time they got to Saturday, it's the Sabbath, and they've got all day to just think. To just think, is this really happening? He was meant to restore the kingdom to Israel, but now he's dead. So I guess guess if he's dead, he can't do it. Maybe he really was just the servant and not the king. And they wait and they wonder, reviewing their theology as they stay locked up and huddled indoors for fear that those that persecuted Jesus would come hunting for them. By the time we get to Sunday, some of Jesus' disciples, I mean, not the 12, well, at this point, there weren't 12 Judas did his thing. We know what happened to him, right? And, and, and then, you know, Thomas wasn't with them, so Tana huddled. What do you think? What do you guys think? I mean, he's dead. This is the guy that we followed. By the time it got to Sunday morning, when you could start to move again, because Sabbath is like, do nothing. By the time they get to Sunday, some of the disciples have decided, we're getting out of Dodge. They're like, we're leaving. I'm not waiting for these religious leaders to catch up with me. They're going to hunt us down. We're getting out. One of those people was somebody called Cleopas. He was actually Jesus' uncle. And Jesus, you know, uh, has died at this point. And Cleopas and another disciple who we don't know who he is, right? They decide we're getting out. So they're on the road to a place called Emmaus. And what are they doing? They're talking about everything that's happened. Still rocked and reeling from the situation Jesus decides because at this point in the story he has already resurrected but they don't know about it because they de- they've just decided to get out so he decides to join them on the journey but to keep them from seeing who he was he masks his appearance because he's God and he can do anything right this is where we join the story Luke 24 19 he said to them what things in other words what are the things that you have been talking about and they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth a man who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him but we had hoped now underline this part we had hoped we thought until this until a couple of days ago We hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel and restore the kingdom to us. We hoped. But now, knowing what we know, it cannot be. We thought he was the king. Turns out he was probably just a servant. Not what we expected. They're starting to change their minds again. He says, yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Third day is important because in Jewish culture, if you died on the first day, it was kind of odd in the sense that they thought you might still come back to life. So there's like dead, and then there's third day dead, and third day dead is a lot more dead than first day dead. You, You got me? They're like, yeah, he died, but it's the first day. Oh, but this is three days dead. What are they really saying? They're saying, so it's over. We thought he was the king, but it's the third day. Looks like he was only ever just a servant. And I understand why they might have reconsidered. I understand why they might have changed their minds again. It's hard to walk by faith when your eyes are functional. Amen? Hard to walk by faith and continue to confess what you believe when you just saw your Savior, the one you, you claimed was the Messiah, be so badly beaten and destroyed that they could hardly recognize Him as a man as He hung on the cross. They, the, the Scriptures say that there was no human semblance. It's like we, He was hardly recognizable as a man. That's how badly beaten and torn up His body was. They saw that. And seeing something like that might cause you to reconsider what you previously held as truth about the king. So I get it. 
But how many of you understand now, with our perspective, looking back, we say, he was just as much the king on Saturday as he was on Sunday. He was no less the king in what they perceived to be the lowest point of their journey. He is always the king. You have never had a day where he hasn't ruled and reigned supreme as king on planet earth. He was the Messiah on Thursday, all the way through Friday, still while he was in the grave on Saturday and 100% as he resurrected on Sunday. He was the king in every single season and everything that they went through, he was the king the whole way. They were the ones that had the up and down, not not him, not him. So you got to confess on Saturday what you believed on Thursday. Don't doubt in the dark what you heard in the light, because here's what I've understood to be true. Everyone goes through Saturday. We all have Saturdays. If you haven't had a Saturday, you've been following Jesus for a couple of weeks. God bless you. Uh, and you know, because the truth is we have things that challenge us and maybe, I don't know, hmm. Maybe the thing that came and confronts you and challenges you is a diagnosis while you wait for test results. That's Saturday. Just thinking. Just waiting. Or people that on their wedding day decided that they were going to be married will be together forever, but now... They say, I don't know if God can piece back together what looks like it's been torn apart. Spending time apart from their spouse, that's Saturday. Sometimes Saturday is knowing you've got a bill to pay, but you just lost your job and you don't know what you're going to feed the kids. Hey, come on, that's Saturday. Come on. And you pray and you wait and you wait and you wait. The disciples, what did they do? They saw the Messiah die. They witnessed Him be killed. And... <laughs> You know, the truth is, for all the faith that the apostles had, not one of them believed that he was going to be resurrected from the dead. I mean, if they, if they thought that he was going to be resurrected, surely they would have camped out by the tomb. Just watched, just waiting, just ready to celebrate the thing that was a, a maybe, you know, being, instead of being huddled in fear at home, it was like a surprise party, getting ready for the greatest announcement ever. But that's not what's happening. That's not the story. In fact, Mary went to the tomb with some women, prepared spices, not spices for a man that's resurrected, but for one who is dead. None of them even believed that it was possible he could be resurrected. I guess they changed their minds again. And so Mary came and she knocks at the door. She says, we just came from the tomb. And I'm telling you, I don't know where they've taken his body. And so Peter says, I've got to check it out for myself. Listen to me, church. You've got to check this out for yourself. If you came to church today and you're not sure what you believe, the message we preach, you should, you should check it out for yourself. Because if Jesus died and was never resurrected, then everything we say is false. But if he's alive as we proclaim, then this is the greatest message you will ever hear in your life. And I promise you it's worth checking out. Check it out, check it out, check it out. Think again. You've got an opportunity today to reconsider what you previously held as truth. Mary says, come and see if it's true. Peter and John decide we're going to check it out. John 20, verse 4 to 9, it says, Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but not, did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself because Jesus is neat. It occurred to me that if my children decide that they really want to walk in Jesus' footsteps, they're going to have to tidy their bedroom. Jesus was neat. Then the other disciple would reach the tomb first, also went in, but... and. And he saw and, and he believed. And I only can take that to mean that previously he must have disbelieved. 
So I guess he changed his mind. But then he saw this and he, I guess he changed his mind again. Wait, I thought he was the servant, but now he's not here. Maybe, maybe he really is the king because up until this point, verse 9 says, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. He had to die. You know what's crazy is if he didn't die, there was no penalty that was paid for sins. And that means that if the penalty hasn't been paid, then people, you, me, we would have to pay for our sins. And what they thought was the low point of the whole weekend was actually the high point. Because the penalty had been paid, but you and I know something greater than that. The penalty had been paid, but if there was no resurrection, then salvation is a sham. Everything we believe is fake and false and phony. Do you understand that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is 100% central to everything we believe? You cannot put your faith in Jesus without believing in the resurrection. And so here they are. And they run to the tomb and they suddenly realize the power that was once veiled has now finally been revealed. Jesus has resurrected. He really is the King. He is the King. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. Come on, don't just see a servant and miss the King. Don't allow a season of darkness where you've been in the dark about what God is doing, allow you to transition what you previously held as truth about God and and, and see something different. Don't see the servant and miss the king. The disciples thought it's the low point. It was actually the high point. And the story taking its twists and turns and they had no idea what could happen or or what should happen. But we know looking back that what Jesus did on the cross that day after he was resurrected, resurrected, secured everything we hold as truth. It means that it inaugurated a covenant of grace. He lived the perfect life that we could never live. And then He paid the penalty for all of our mistakes. We call it a covenant of grace. What does that mean? Well, that's the gospel. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. It's what He did and nothing that we have to add to it. It's all Him and none of us. That's why the scripture says, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory, oh, death? Where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is law. What does that mean? It means you sin now, but you pay for it later. So you sin now and you're walking around like everything is fine, but it's not. If you don't address the sting, the death will catch up with you. And we know when we've done the wrong thing because the law points it out. And then it follows up with, but thanks be to God who gives us a victory that we could never have on our own through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He delivered to us what we could never get on our own. And do you know what this means? The fact that He's alive means everything we say about the gospel is real. Everything we say about Him has to be truth. It means that He came, He died, He buried, He was resurrected, He ascended to the Father, but I promise you this, one day He's coming back. Do you know what this means? It means however you came in today, He can separate your sins as far as the east is from the west. No matter what you've done, no matter the mistake that you've made, you can take time today to reconsider who you are and what you believe and who Jesus is and what He has done. And if you put your faith in the one who gave it all for you, He will forgive you from every wrong thing you've ever done. This is the greatest message the world has ever, ever heard. It gets no better than this. It means that we are justified. Justification is this beautiful thing where it means we exchanged our sinful lives for His perfect life. That means that no matter what we do, when God looks on us, He sees the righteousness of His Son and not the mistakes of our past or even our present, not even of our future. I tell you this, Christians should be the least self-righteous people on the planet because we know that all of our righteousness comes from someone who gave it to us. We didn't get it. We didn't earn it. He gave it to us. It means Jesus' death on the cross turned what might have been punishment into blessing. We call that propitiation. 
Jesus was the sacrifice that turned what would have been punishment for our sins into blessing in our life. And I promise you this, all God wants to do with you is bless you, bless you, bless you. And that, (laughs) that is why Easter is the greatest weekend we have. And on this weekend, all we do is point to Him and celebrate and thank Him and praise Him and worship Him because it is all about Him. Amen. Come on, give Him some praise. Give Him some praise. Let's take a moment, close your eyes. If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus, but today you hear this message and understand that everything that I'm saying, that it is truth. Doesn't matter whether you're watching online or if you're sitting in here today, you have this day to reconsider what you previously held as truth. You came in one way or you started watching one way and you can leave another. And it all begins with giving your life to the one who gave you his You say a short prayer, a simple prayer. It's not about all of getting the right words. It's about the meaning coming from your heart. It would be my great privilege to lead you in that prayer. So whether you're in here today or you're watching online, if today you say, I wanna make a decision to follow Jesus, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, come on, everyone, let's say this together. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me that you died on the cross for my sins. I receive you today as my Lord and Savior. And I choose to follow you every day for the rest of my life in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and gave God a shout of praise. Come on, let's give Him some praise.